Hello, good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here with you today and to discuss a little bit about strongly lensed quasars and the, about different ways to discover lensed quasars using astrometry, especially. Um, so in this talk, I would be very happy if by the end of the talk uh, you leave the room knowing why we are studying and looking for strongly lensed quasars and how this particular group is, um, is detecting uh, lensed quasars, so how we are searching for them. So let's quickly see why, so the first, the, the reasons why we are doing this. So this, my, my particular view, why I am doing this, is because they are beautiful objects. Seriously, that's why I am doing this. But unfortunately, we are living in a barbarian world, and no funding agency would allow you to spend money <laughs> just because you want to find beauty in the universe, right? So the next good reason why uh, strongly lensed quasars are important um, is because they are, in a certain way, variable objects. So I will explain. They are among the most interesting and useful extragalactic phenomena. So a strongly lensed quasars for computer, sciences in the com computer scientists in the room, it's a phenomena that happens when the light of a background quasar is deflected in the gravitational field of a galaxy between us and the quasar, right? And then there are multiple images of the background quasar that appear in different positions in the sky. Um, but as I was saying, the quasars are variable objects. They vary in time, and one interesting thing is that the path that the light in one path, in one, for one of the images and other Im in the other image will be different. And the gravitational pull, that the gravitational experience that they have, they will have in the field of the massive object will be different as well. So those two effects, they conspire to, in, to create a time delay. So when there is a variation in the light of one of the images, there will be a certain time before the light of the other images suffer the same variation, right? So these plots are showing, for instance, two light curves, so magnitude or brightness in function of time, of a certain quasar. Of a, of a certain image, and this other plot shows for the other image. So what happens is that if you can measure those two light curves, and if you can measure this time delay, it's actually very simple. If you just believe in general relativity, and if you do a little bit of modeling of how your lens system uh, um, is, or, is organized, you can actually infer one of the probably holy grails of modern astronomy, that it's the value of the Hubble constant. And the, the reason why is this, this is one of the holy grails of modern astro astronomy, it's because this constant is under a very strong tension nowadays. So we have two different types of experiments measuring two different values that are already incompatible at more than 3.8 sigma, right? And this is this new physics, is this just a system, systematics on the experiments that are not being corrected? Well, at the moment, nobody knows yet. In any way, it's a very interesting thing, and this is a very uh, good way to actually justify why we are looking for beauty in the universe, right? <laughs> um, but why we need to look for more quasars? Well, I showed you, we know one, right? One of the problems of this is that this part here it's plagued by modeling problems. So either your model is wrong or your specific quasar is suffering micro or any other reasons why, well, there are several different reasons why this part here, especially the potential, could be wrong. If we had a large number of quasars, everything would probably disappear on um, uh, the central theorem of limits, right? However, the problem is that we know very, very few quasars that are lensed like this. Uh, the most important quasars that are lensed like this are the quadruply imaged quasars, so the ones that I showed you, one like the Einstein cross, where you can see four images of the quasar. They are very good because they are very good to constrain the modeling, so they are good to constrain this part of the equation. Um, the, but we know, well, until last year, we only new 40, 45, I think, um, it was 45, 46, that were spectroscopically confirmed. 
until the data release tool of Gaia last year. Okay, so we are trying to develop ways to detect new quadruply, especially quadruply image quasars. But how we are doing, now that we saw why we are doing, why we are trying to solve this problem, how we are solving this problem. But first, before talking about how, we should talk about we, because I'm talking about ah, we are doing this. Who, who is we in this? So this is um, a small collaboration that was uh, gathered around, around Gaia. I will comment about Gaia in a minute. Uh, with a few um, guilty faces that you can probably meet also in the audience, or some of them you might knew from um, other um, conferences in astronomy. Um, and I forgot myself. I oh, know I'm here. So. Okay, so we organized this small group in 2015, more or less. In the beginning, we were just studying methods, just methodology. And after the data release one of Gaia, we tried some methods in data release one, but the data release one of Gaia had a very bad spatial resolution. I will comment about the data release two in a second. And then in the second data release last year, we started actually finding uh, new objects using the methodology that we have been developing in the past five year, uh, four, four or five years. Okay, why Gaia? So, um, Gaia is the um, all sky survey, specially created for astrometry. But there is one thing that makes Gaia unique for other types of studies in astronomy is that it's the first true all sky survey that has a resolving power of 180 milli arc seconds. So the entire sky is being observed with a spatial resolution that's similar to HST, but not just small fields. It's the entire sphere, right? And most of the quasars that were not yet found are very small, are the order of one arc second. All the lancet quasars that uh, still haven't been found are the other order of one, um, one something arc second. And another thing that's interesting of Gaia for lensed quasars is that its special, its um, astrometric accuracy reaches for the images of quasars uh, around 100 microseconds. This is extremely constraining for the model of the quasar. And remember, you need to model the quasar to actually infer the H naught, so the uh, Hubble, Hubble constant. Okay. So uh, there was a study a few years ago, 10, ten years ago, more or less that studied how many quasars Gaia would observe, would detect, and we would probably multiply by 10 the number of do doubly imaged quasars. We know today 100 to 100 doubly imaged quasars, and it would multiply by 5 the number of quadruply imaged quasars. So we know, um, we knew until last year 47 more or less, 46 more or less, now, oh, after the final data release, we will know probably 250, more or less. Depending on the cosmological model, these numbers can vary a little bit. Um, the challenge of, uh, sorry, the challenge of finding those objects in Gaia uh, is here, right? So this morning, I just took the number of um, how many observations Gaia, how many measurements Gaia uh, had done, um, and the number is one trillion, right? So those are not going to the catalog, but if you want to find all those quasars, all those lancet quasars, in the end of the mission, we are not going to escape. We will need to go to the raw data. So we will need to go to the trillions of measurements. Nowadays, we are, tra we are working only with 1.8 billion objects. So all those measurements are creating, uh, this is the Gaia Data Release 2. This is a visualization of Gaia Data, data Release 2. This is not an image, this is not a picture of the sky. This is almost a scatter plot of the contents of the Gaia catalog, right? So if you just add all those points inside each pixel and add the flux of, those, of all those points, you actually reconstruct a perfect image, right? So it's, uh, this is something that I think is amazing. I never saw um, a visualization of a catalog creating an image that is as realistic as this one. Anyway, so from those 1.8 billion sources, we want to find the Lancet quasars that we are going to be just a few tens, probably, in Gaia Data Release 2. So how we are doing this? So we are developing three different techniques. Uh, in the future, they are going to speak with each other, but now they are really three independent techniques. Uh, the first one 
It's by using astrometry and single epoch photometry only. So this is the easiest one to understand. So basically the idea is, we get back to the Einstein cross. We are seeing the four images here. The idea is, can we find a method that given the 1.8 billion sources would extract patterns for which the distances between the images and the ratio between the fluxes of the images would be similar to what we expect a lanthanid quasar to produce. Right? So this is the idea behind all this method. Uh, so this is the idea. The implementation of the method is a little bit more complex, but the idea is this. So basically we start from the raw Gaia catalog, all the 1.8 billion sources. We cut, we cut the Gaia catalog either using a KD3 or using a Helpix. After, for each Helpix level or for each KD3 leaf, we verify the compatibility of um, uh, the colors, the proper motions between the sources. And, uh, sorry, the uh, yeah, proper motions I wrote. Movement pop. <laughs> um, and using those um, variables, we enter in the machine learning method. The machine learning method that we are using originally was a random forest. Now it's an extremely randomized tree. So basically it's a random forest where the, you don't optimize the cut. You just do it completely random. So everything is random. Different from a random forest where you optimize cuts. Right? Um, and um, after the classifier, if the classifier say that's not a lens, we just throw it away. This happened for most of the 1.8 billion objects. If it's a lens, we try to model and also to follow up spectroscopically. We are going to see this later on. In the end, if the, spectros if the spectros, um, spectral observation confirms that's a lens, it's a lens. In the end, it's the spectra that tell us, tells us to confirm if, it's, if we're dealing with a lens or just projection of a star and a quasar or um, double quasars and things like that. But, well, an extremely randomized tree is a supervised method, as uh, most of people in this room um, know. So a supervised method requires a training set. But we only have 40 <laughs> lenses to train. How can we deal with this? So in this first approach, we don't deal with the 40 real lenses. We produce simulations. So we believe, well, we assume that we know how to simulate lenses, so we produce 106 million of simulations of lenses, and uh, we simulate Gaia observations of it. So which one of those points are actually how Gaia would see the lenses, like right? just at one point. And um, there is one thing that's very important. We use simulations, but we add an error for in, to all the simulations because we don't know if the model is perfect, right? And also we have the errors of the observation itself. So everything, uh, all of this is added to the simulations, to the perfect simulation. So if you want to train a supervised model to apply in real life, you should train with a bias set that's going to be, that's going to match uh, the data sets that you are applying the methods to, right? So we apply these methods to Gaia Data Release 2, and I'm going to show later the lenses that we discovered but we rediscovered 90% of the known lenses. So at least the method was being able to rediscover all, so all those, all those images here are lenses that were already known. Okay, the second method. The second method, it's um, a little bit more innovative. The idea of the second method, of the second method is to use uh, unresolved time series. So it's very easy, uh, no, it's not very easy, but it's easier from the ground to observe time series for a large number of objects. The problem of the ground is the spatial resolution. So your quasar, most often, your lens of the quasar, most often than not, will become a single blob, right? So what happens if your quasar becomes a single blob, one single object? So let's see. Suppose that this is one known lens of the quasar, and this is the light curve of the known lens of the quasar. If you have a lens of the quasar, you have several copies of the same light curve, right? Just delayed in time. What happens if you're observing this from the ground? If you're observing this object from the ground, you are going to see one single blob that is actually the addition, and the light curve that you're going to observe is the addition 
of all the light curves of the individual images. And this produces something that's very interesting. The light curve that you are going to observe from the ground will actually be oops, less stochastic than the light curve that you would observe for, for a known lensed quasar. Because since you are, observe, you are observing the same light curve added to itself delayed in time, it's like doing a smoothing in the light curve, right? <laughs> so the stochasticity uh, will decrease. So if you measure any, any measurement of entropy on top of this light curve, the entropy should be lower than for the population of known lensed quasars. Right, so um, we, we performed um, this measurement using one measurement of entropy called moved scale of entropy. And this plot shows um, the result of it. So in X, you are seeing the value of the entropy in Y, the density. So this is just a PDF. The red curve shows the PDF for the unresolved non-gravitational lenses in the data set. And the blue shows the PDF for everything else, all the other quasars. So it's interesting to see that indeed, as we had suspected, the entropy, the distribution of entropy, is lower for the lensed quasars that you cannot resolve. And this is amazing by itself, because actually you can have an indicator of a lensed quasar without ever resolving the lens, right? Uh, obviously, there will be other contamin contaminants, and we discovered that depending on what you add together with the quasar, if it has started as a variable star, it will also increase, it will also decrease the entropy, right? Um, anyway, but this is already another hint to discover new quasars. We are using this measurement of entropy together with the resolved astrometer from the, well, so the entropy, unresolved entropy measured from the ground from Catalina and a little bit of ZTF now, together with the resolved astrometry from Gaia and also the resolved photometer from Gaia. We are using a support vector machine with a classical RBF kernel, and we do a hyperparameter optimization using a Gaussian process, just to choose the parameters of the kernel, nothing complex. And based on this, we select candidates for lens or not lenses based on the Gaia. So this is the second method. So the third method, um, it's a very, very new method. This method has a few months. Uh, we developed it in the beginning of this, uh, this year, and we just tested it in the last run, in the last observational run that we had. It's based on astrometry and imaging. So basically, we select quasars, that, uh, quasars from Gaia that are bad, that have very bad astrometry, and then we go and we get the images from pan stars of these quasars. And based on these images, so these are just six images, uh, example images, we perform a wavelet decomposition. So we wavelet transform all the images for three different channels. And for each wavelet decomposition of the image, of each image in each channel, we compute like a wavelet pore spectrum. So it's just like the Fourier pore spectrum is the amount of power that you have per scale, but for each different channel. So I was very lazy, so I just used J JPEGs. <laughs> Uh, because it was faster, but you could do this, so it was RGB, but we could do this using UGRIS, uh, the normal astrometry, uh, astronom astronomical filters. And if we do this, if we compute this power spectrum, so this plot is showing a matrix. Each line of the matrix, sorry, each line is a quasar, okay? And you can see probably four, five blocks. There is one block here one block here, one here, another there, and another there. So this is the air, R, G, B channels, and this is a color, R minus G, and this is a color, G minus R. So basically, we are also computing the different, the, the, we subtract the channels, and we wavelet transform and compute the power spectrum of the subtraction, okay? So what we do is this. So we do a simple hierarchical clustering. And you can see already in this image that if each line is a quasar, the quasars are clustering together in a few classes, right? What is amazing in this image that you cannot see yet is that the lenses are here. So most of the lenses are there. 
this is not all the lenses. But the interesting thing is that the lenses that are here are the lenses that are more or less like this object here. Actually, they contain information about the galaxy. Even if the survey was not capable of analyzing the image and extracting as the point source the galaxy and the images of the quasars, by studying the wavelet power spectrum, you can observe that in the wavelet space, in the wavelet power spectrum space, you can get a hint that there is a galaxy around a bluish emission, which would indicate a lensed quasar, right? Okay, but as we were commenting yesterday, methods themselves are not enough. So just doing methodology by the sake of methodology, we're still missing something. We need something to run these methods, methods on, right? So um, this group also um, implemented a pipeline inside an infrastructure. So the pipe, this infrastructure is a machine that um, we uh, configured specially for Gaia. So it's a simple uh, shared memory machine with 48 cores and one terabyte of run and two terabytes of uh, PCI Express attached SSDs. So in the day of the data release two uh, of Gaia, we transferred the entire Gaia directly to the memory of the machine for the, uh, ESA, the ESA content and delivery network. And we started running the day, the day itself, right, in the day of the data release two. Nowadays, we have uh, added other data for all the known quasars and all the quasar candidates so the machine also contains uh, the ZTF data, PANSTARS, WISE, Catalina, and we have a TAP connection in the pipeline, so we can actually grab uh, any, any, any TAP um, prepared uh, data set, right? Okay, but once we selected the candidates, the candidates go to spectroscopic confirmation in ground telescopes, right? We need to observe the spectra of those candidates. We are using the Palomar Hale, <laughs> this venerable telescope over there, uh, together with Keck and ISO NTT and Gemini South to confirm the quasars, to confirm the lenses. And one thing that we do, it's continuous learning. So at each batch of observations, all the observations, they go back in the training of those two methods, right? So the unsupervised ignores it, but the, the supervised methods learn from what we are observing along the time. Um, if we were software engineers, so this would be some, and the methods, we are develop, developing the methods also along the time. So we would be, we, this would be called probably agile science. Right? So it's um, agile methodology, applied science. Okay, um, some lenses that we discovered during this program. Uh, this was the first one. So the, each one of those points it's indicating a Gaia measurement. You can see the size of the lens. So it's 1.3 1, 1 arc seconds, more or less. With this distance here, it's uh, about 300, 400 milli arc seconds. Um, this was the first one that we discovered. And I am almost sure that this was also the first one that was discovered before an image was taken. So we discovered this lens from the astrometry, from the Gaia astrometry itself. Then we confirmed in Keck, but there is no image of, the, of this lens. Right. We still don't have a, a good image of it. Uh, the second one that is very interesting that uh, this method is discovered is this uh, that we call the Orion, Orion crossbow because it looks like a crossbow, right? Um, and the interesting thing of this lens is look at the size. It's 5.6 arc seconds wide and it was in Panstars. So it was there waiting to be discovered for many, many years. A method was missing, was, we were lacking methods to discover this lens from, um, from Panzers. And um, well, there are many other lenses that we have been discovering. So since May 2018, that's when we started grabbing Gaia data, preparing lists of candidates, going to telescopes, trying to confirm. We discovered 14 lenses and uh, most of them, uh, I think that um, eight or nine of them are quads. In our, previous, in our past runs in NTT and Keck, we discovered two more quads and perhaps five or six doubles in addition to, to those 14 lenses that we had already discovered. And one that's remarkable is this one, is this quadruple image squazer. So this one that we have been calling the arrow, um, look to the size of it. 
So this is six arc seconds, and this is four arc seconds, and the galaxy is in the middle. This lens was in the Digital Sky Survey, the DSS. I'm not talking about the low in Digital Sky Survey. I'm talking about the DSS from the 90s. The lens is there, and nobody found it. How it's possible? Anyway. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, indeed. Um, anyway, it was amazing that the methods helped us. And even, so we found this lens in data release one, but we didn't observe it, this lens, because even we could not believe that a lens that was 12 arc seconds wide had not been discovered before, right? And also because there is a little bit of difference in color between those two and those two. And this is because of the reddening, probably, of the galaxy. Um, anyway, now we have, so this, it, this lens was discovered in NTT, and we got this um, confirmation from Keck, and also the, the uh, redshift for the galaxy and for the, all, all, the, all the images. So, okay, um, that's it. Thank you very much. I think that, um, per, I, 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 would, I would hope that now you can have a hint on why we are trying to discover more lensed quasars and how this group Grau is trying, is trying to attack this problem. Um, if you have any doubts, um, I'm happy to answer questions. And you can also check the papers that we have, we have been publishing since last year. Thank you.